Bienvenidos a este nuevo evento del ciclo especializado de formación, trabajo, salud y estrés organizado por AERE de Sura en colaboración con PRAX, el Grupo de Investigación Estrés y Salud de la Universidad de los Andes y el Centro de Epidemiología Social. Este ciclo de formación tiene cuatro ejes temáticos, diez conferencias, nueve expertos de cuatro países diferentes y es equivalente a 15 horas de formación especializada. Tenemos el placer de contar con 1.586 participantes de 747 empresas diferentes distribuidas en 114 actividades económicas y esperamos que fruto de este proceso formativo que estamos llevando cada uno de nosotros impactemos positivamente la, el bienestar y las condiciones laborales de 626.388 trabajadores. Recuerde que usted puede escuchar esta conferencia en el idioma original, en este caso será eh, inglés, o si lo desea, también puede escuchar la conferencia en eh, español activando la opción de traducción que encuentran en la parte inferior derecha. Solamente deben de seleccionar allí la opción deseada y eh, eligen la opción de español. Adicionalmente, ustedes pueden participar durante esta conferencia de dos formas, mediante el chat que encuentran en la parte inferior central de su pantalla. Mediante el chat ustedes podrán compartir apreciaciones, comentarios generales que tengan sobre lo que vamos tratando durante la conferencia. Y si usted tiene alguna pregunta que desee que realicemos al expositor, le agradecemos mucho, exclusivamente la realice por la opción de preguntas y respuestas. Durante todo el evento, mi colega, la doctora Viviola Gómez, estará revisando sus preguntas, organizándolas, procesándolas, para que en los últimos 30 minutos del de evento tengamos la oportunidad de resolverlas con nuestra invitada del día de hoy. La asistencia va a ser tomada al final del evento mediante un formulario que vamos a publicar mediante el chat. Eh, recuerde que a quien asista todo el ciclo va a tener un certificado especial, que no va a tener un certificado por cada uno de los eventos a los cuales haya asistido. Y algunas horas después de finalizado este evento, usted va a poder ver, comentar y compartir sus opiniones sobre cada una de las conferencias en la página de memorias del de ciclo de formación que hemos elaborado para ustedes, el cual les enviaremos nuevamente el enlace al finalizar el día cuando ya la grabación esté disponible. No siendo más, le doy la palabra a mi colega, la doctora Viviola Gómez, directora del Grupo de Investigación Estrés y Salud de la Universidad de Los Andes, quien ha sido la líder de la propuesta pedagógica del ciclo de formación Trabajo, Salud y Estrés. Viviola, bienvenida. Gracias, Sebastián. Buenos días a todos. Me place mucho darles la bienvenida a esta sesión tan especial a cargo de nuestra colega Laura Funet. Laura eh, ya nos dictó una charla previamente, pero por si acaso algunas personas no estuvieron presentes ese día, quiero recordarles quién es Laura. Laura tiene formación en salud ocupacional y epidemiología. Es además actualmente profesora en la Universidad de Massachusetts, además de en otras instituciones, y es profesora adjunta además en varias universidades de otros países diferentes a los Estados Unidos. Laura codirige uno de los centros de la, para la excelencia en salud completa o total para los trabajadores, que este es uno de los pocos centros en los Estados Unidos que reciben fondos de la NIOSH para apoyar investigación y actividades en pro de la salud de los trabajadores en los Estados Unidos. Laura hoy nos va a presentar un tema del cual todos han estado preguntando y todos han tenido muchas eh, preguntas a lo largo de las diferentes conferencias. Yo quiero resaltar algo que es muy importante y es que a través de todo este ciclo de conferencias nosotros hemos tratado de mostrarles cómo cuando tenemos problemas de estrés en el trabajo, sus causas están más en la forma en que la organización funciona y en las que la organización trata o organiza el trabajo de sus eh, personas colaboradoras. De manera que hemos estado tratando todo el tiempo de insistirles Busque por ahí cómo usted puede hacer cambio organizacional, cómo usted puede ayudar a sus trabajadores, más que cambiando a los trabajadores, cambiando la forma en que trabajan. Y por eso es tan importante esta conferencia y la de que tendremos la próxima semana, porque aquí vamos a darles una serie de herramientas e ideas. Claramente no podemos pedirle a Laura que agote todas las opciones, porque pues claramente son muchas cosas y, y en muchos casos tienen que ser muy específicas eh, para, para cada sitio de trabajo, pero estoy segura de que Laura nos va a presentar una serie de ideas que van a ser muy útiles para todos 
para darnos ideas de cómo podemos abordar los cambios desde el punto de vista de la organización, no tanto con las personas. No siento más, le doy la palabra a Laura porque estamos todos muy ansiosos de escucharte, Laura, hoy. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, I, it's really an honor to participate in this series, uh, and I look forward to uh, hearing uh, the comments and the questions afterwards because it's the dialogue that I always find the most rewarding. Uh, I, I want to emphasize I'm going to be sharing ideas that come from the work of a lot of people. You see three different university names here. I'm at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, um, but our research center uh, includes many colleagues uh, who have together carried out the work represented in this talk. And uh, I, I wouldn't have room on the slide if I were to put all of the names, but um, it is a, a very much a joint effort among many people. So when I spoke, hmm, when I spoke uh, last, uh, last time, uh, three weeks ago, uh, I, I was speaking about the costs of job stress, but I was also leading up to the importance of prevention in the way that Viviola was just mentioning through better organization of work. And uh, I talked about the fact that we need to go deep sometimes to find the root causes and also that we want to be thoughtful in the way that we introduce solutions so that we don't further disempower employees and make the problem worse because decision opportunity or lack of decision opportunity is such a critical aspect of job stress. I'm going this these ideas generated a lot of questions from you. I'm going to speak very quickly to a couple of those in terms of um, what to do and what not to do when we think about interventions and how to sell this idea to top management because many of your questions at the end of the last session had to do with um, how to make the case uh, about why job stress should be prevented. Why is it worth the investment of resources? I gave you some of that evidence. You gave me back some counter arguments that you expect to hear. So we can, I hope, continue a dialogue about how to, how to address these issues. Uh, so I know you heard last week about the, the concept of primary prevention being redesign of the workplace. Uh, this is another way to present the same idea. This comes from NIOSH, actually, from the Total Worker Health webpage. Uh, the hierarchy of controls is a traditional occupational safety and health prevention principle, uh, which is routinely taught to specialists in occupational safety and ergonomics and industrial hygiene, all aspects of occupational health and safety. And here it's just being applied um, to the prevention of job stress in the context of the total worker health program. So again, the idea is that effective stress prevention means elimination of the workplace hazards that threaten well-being and uh, as, as much as possible. And, and of course, there are some elements that can't be completely eliminated, such as working night shifts, um, which, which have uh, a risk to health as well, uh, both physical and mental health. So these kinds of issues have to be managed through engineering uh, or administrative changes as much as possible. And we want to save for the very last option, um, putting the emphasis on the individual to change how they respond to these stressors. Because if, if we only focus on their coping skills, we put the entire burden on them to handle the situation and we leave the institutional pressures and constraints unchanged. Uh, so so this, uh, we, we want to be um, emphasizing these elements at the top as much as possible. Um, a question was raised uh, at the end of the last session about the stress that workers bring from home. Of course, we all do experience challenges in our personal lives from time to time. 
But if all of the stress that is manifested in the workforce was due only to our personal problems, then we would never see associations like this in the epidemiologic literature. I, I showed you this graph three weeks ago, where the number of positive organizational characteristics in a job had a strong relationship with nursing home workers' intention to leave their jobs. If the stress that people are experiencing was only due to home situations, then we wouldn't see this trend because in a large population, those stresses would be distributed evenly across the whole population or they would be distributed randomly across the whole population. So we wouldn't see this very pronounced differential among the different levels of exposure. In addition, most studies like this one um, that are large use statistical methods for, to adjust for individual factors that might themselves be correlated with stress at home. So as an aside, I'd actually like to suggest that the, the, another answer to the question about home and family stresses <clears throat> makes it even more important for us to protect personal time from work encroaching on people's family lives. Because if people don't have time to handle personal matters when they aren't at work, then if, if in other words, if work bleeds into, bleeds over into personal time, then family and personal stress is actually more likely to bleed over in the other direction and interfere with work. So it, it's again, a reminder to us that, that those, uh, those, redesign aspects of how we approach the job uh, need our full attention. There was also a question about job rotation, which was very interesting because it's not usually raised in relation to job stress. It's usually raised in relation to physical exposures. These are obviously two automobile assembly workers whom I studied uh, a number of years ago. And in this kind of a situation, rotating workers from one physically stressful situation to another um, just creates physical overload on more body parts. It doesn't actually remove the hazard. And I think we can see that visually here very well. Even if the alternative job is physically easier, knowing that you're going to have to return to the painful one can cause stress through anticipating it and not having a choice about it and being aware that it's not being fixed. And I would suggest that something similar might happen if we're thinking about job stress. If you have no control over severe time pressure or a hostile supervisor, the, the feeling that that evokes in you doesn't go away when you're physically somewhere else in another part of the building or, or working with different people because it can be very stressful to anticipate returning to that situation. And knowing that it's not being fixed can also create negative emotions about the institution's lack of taking responsibility. So I think we wanna avoid the idea of just rotating people from one place to another as a substitute for actually fixing the problem. So, and this isn't a new idea. The World Health Organization uh, called on us several decades ago to take an environmental approach to health promotion. And they specifically talked about removing obstacles to health, which is very much about redesigning the environment, in this case, the work environment. And they also specifically talked about fostering positive decision-making opportunities, which again, maps very nicely onto uh, decision-making opportunities in the workplace. Uh, so, so again, if, if people are fearing for their physical safety during the work shift, if they are uh, experiencing poor supervision or poor coworker relationships, if their work schedules uh, interfere with their being healthy, then these are things we want to address through changes in the work environment. And of course, you've heard over and over again about the importance of decision-making opportunity or job control in terms of its risk for chronic disease, both behavioral and physiological pathways. So I want us to keep in mind that any program to improve workforce health should be 
aiming to do that in a way that enhances worker decision-making opportunities. Otherwise, it could even end up that money spent on other activities is wasted because it produces only short-term changes that aren't sustained and might even reduce the credibility of later initiatives. Okay, so that's enough about what not to do. Let's talk about what to do. Um, so decision-making opportunities at work can be improved by the way the work is organized. People can be given opportunities to participate in decisions, even very small local decisions about the timing of when they perform different tasks in their job. Uh, people very often have skills that they bring to the workplace and don't have the opportunity to use. So uncovering the strengths that people bring to the job and their creativity in problem solving benefits everyone. Uh, time pressure and job scheduling can be a huge source of stress. Uh, why don't we support collaborative self-scheduling such as flexible work hours? Um, people are very motivated to have flexibility in their work hours and they can work very effectively together to figure out schedules that accommodate different people's needs. And this also inter, uh, it improves interpersonal relationships at work. It provides positive coworker support and collaboration. So I'm going to be really emphasizing this idea of worker participation in workplace change, in, in changing the, the work process. And there are two big reasons really why. One is this, this first point that opportunities to change the work environment uh, supports people viewing themselves and being viewed as active decision makers. So this whole idea of job control, that's the top half of this slide. The other issue is that insights that are derived from workers' own perspectives are really essential to developing a program that responds to their needs and that is feasible for them in light of their workplace and life situations. We, we need a pragmatic understanding that if we don't take their experiences into account, the change process is going to, it's going to stall. It's not going to go anywhere. So, so we need to be um, uncovering those root causes. We need to fit our solutions into the particular context of your workplace. As Viviola said in introducing me, there are general principles. I'm going to show you how they've been applied in specific situations. And then it's, it's your job to work with the employees in your workplace to figure out how to customize those to a particular setting. Uh, we offer a program that we've developed with uh, NIOSH resources uh, quite a number of years ago now called the Healthy Workplace Participatory Program, the HWPP. And this is a process, uh, a program uh, that was designed by us and field tested by us. Um, we have a, a toolkit of materials which is on our website, uh, all for free at the moment, so far only in English. I'm sorry about that, but uh, I, I hope still that many of these might be useful for you. The core idea is to train a group of employees as what we call a design team and uh, have at one or two facilitators of that group and train them to conduct root cause analysis of whatever workforce health problem they select, develop systematic integrated interventions in the spirit of what I was just describing, and then establish key performance indicators, which are used both to select what is implemented and also then used to evaluate the uh, success of the program. Uh, unpacking this a little bit, it looks like um, any uh, think, do, uh, plan, act type loop. Um, we, we see these kinds of designs very often. Um, the design team here is at the center, the workers who have volunteered to develop constructive solutions. That's why it's called a design team. They're not just reviewing uh, workers' compensation claims or problems that have happened in the past. They're working towards uh, 
fixing problems in a continuous improvement type process. So the design team, as I said, selects health and safety issues to work on one at a time, um, designs interventions based on key performance indicators, develops a business case, presents that to management, and works with management to uh, implement, and implement and evaluate a solution. Management is represented here as what we call the steering committee. It's whatever the group is within the workplace uh, that's already identified as the decision makers. Um, the people who will provide resources, make decisions, oversee implementation of new programs and policies. Um, they're the ones who authorize workers to participate in the design team on paid work time. Um, they're the ones who uh, determine which solutions will be implemented. The two committees communicate both informally and formally. The, the facilitator is a key liaison between these two groups. We're experimenting with other ways of enhancing that communication to support the steering committee staying uh, informed and to uh, help the des design team move forward as quickly as possible. The choice of the facilitator is really key. That person has to be a good communicator. They have to be impartial. Sometimes they're an in-house champion of the program. Uh, sometimes in workplaces that we're working with, we actually designate a research team member um, to help organize and facilitate these processes. So the, the uh, Healthy Workplace Participatory Program has this, uh, what we call the ideas uh, process at its core. Um, again, this step-by-step -step process, uh, developing an understanding of the problem means the root cause analysis, uh, defining a whole range of possible solutions, activities that could be put into effect, uh, evaluating those against the key performance indicators in terms of costs, benefits, barriers, uh, presenting that case, that business case to management, uh, the steering committee then in conjunction with the design team rates the options, selects the one that they choose to implement. And, and then the design team also is involved uh, at least to some extent in the evaluation of that. So it's a very structured process. Uh, the goal is to lead to more complete solutions, to engage and empower employees in problem solving, and to build their self-efficacy, their, their competence and their confidence in their ability to uh, participate in this process. Um, you can see here that actually the two teams do um, operate in parallel to a large extent. At, at the startup, there is training for both the design team, the members of the design team, and also for management about how this process is going to go, what they can expect, uh, why it will be a little while before they hear back from the design team, because the design team is going to be going through the first few steps. And the first time they do it, it takes a little longer because there's a lot of learning involved. Uh, the the um, step two here is the setting goals and objectives. These are the same steps you just saw on the wheel. They're only they're laid out separately to show the two activities. And then uh, these selection criteria, as I said, become the key performance indicators. And then the design team uses those to create at least three different packages of alternative sets of interventions and makes that business case proposal to the steering committee. And then you see here later in the process, lots of back and forth, much more active communication between the two groups um, consulting with each other uh, about implementation and evaluation. So here's an example of what a design team might produce when they're invited to undertake a root cause analysis. This is in a large public sector hospital with uh, over a thousand employees. And this is just the first step in the ideas wheel. So they selected low morale of the staff as the problem they wanted to work on. We were a little nervous because this is a huge topic. And in fact, you can see that their, their fishbone diagram here contained many, many, many different issues from uh, difficulties with parking, low pay to incivility, uh, poor 
poor uh, behavior of employees towards each other, as well as from clients, lack of quality supervision, inadequate equipment. It's just an enormous list of topics that they brainstormed. Uh, and uh, these, of course, none of these are inappropriate to have on the list. You, you've been hearing over the past few weeks that there is uh, a, a broad range of working conditions that can be related to job stress. Uh, so, so we see a lot of those showing up here. Uh, this is another example. This is from staff in a mental health hospital. Uh, they were a little bit more focused. They selected burnout as their topic. Um, they defined it for themselves, uh, not wanting to be at work, not wanting to give 100% effort, uh, being mentally exhausted, just punching in and out of work, but not caring what happens, feeling uh, pessimistic about uh, what's happening in the workplace. They reviewed absenteeism data. They reviewed uh, a report that we provided to them about uh, risk factors for burnout in their own facility from survey data that we had collected. So they put a lot of effort into defining their outcome very clearly, which helps them later in assessing the impact of whatever is implemented. Um, they brainstormed sets of solutions to address burnout, and they are right now uh, about to make a business case presentation to their management. They've been very effective in prioritizing the top issues uh, in their conversation. Uh, we have design teams in a variety of settings uh, underway now or recently conducted. As you can see, this is the one I was just telling you about. Um, we've uh, sponsored this process among office workers who focused on essentially rude behavior within the office and, and how that uh, was a source of stress for people. Um, we've, we've had a pilot study uh, going on about elementary school teachers becoming burned out and leaving the teaching profession as a result. Uh, some colleagues used this process with uh, a, a range of low wage workers in primary care medical services who wanted to focus on being overweight and, and weight loss. Uh, and one of our group used it for um, garage workers in the State Department of Transportation who wanted to fo focus on uh, noise exposure and hearing loss. So of course there are many other settings, but, but in our experience so far, the Healthy Workplace Participatory Program is adaptable to any setting. If you collect the information that you need at the beginning, or if you, if you bring it into your own setting and you, you are well informed about what the issues are in your workplace. And in principle, it's adaptable to any form of job stress or, or other health challenge. I want to emphasize that participation means bringing in all voices. Um, there's a, a big tendency for the lowest wage, lowest status workers to be left out of the conversation. These are the people who generally have the lower decision latitude, more physically strenuous jobs, and more exposure to safety and other workplace hazards. And it, certainly in the United States, and I think in many other countries, people in low wage work, because they earn less money, they tend to live in less desirable neighborhoods. So they may also have fewer resources for being healthy outside of work. They may not have safe places to walk or exercise, access to healthy foods and so on. So these are people who have the greatest needs in terms of health and often face greater obstacles to stress reduction. Uh, just as an example from some data we collected um, previously in the healthcare sector, so this is socioeconomic status, right? Very low, low, medium, high, and, and health being much better among the high wage or high salary employees. And from this same survey, we saw, not surprisingly, physical demands being highest in the very low status workers and decision-making opportunities being the lowest 
for this group. So both of these are very important factors for health. Um, so the, the same people whose jobs are the most physically fatiguing, having the lowest decision latitude. In addition to healthcare, you could think of manufacturing workers, construction laborers, hotel room cleaners. There are many examples of people in this situation. I want to challenge us as, pro as professionals to think about how we can know what kinds of challenges the lowest status workers in our workplaces are facing. We need their input. We need to talk to them. We need to listen to them to learn what kinds of hazards they're facing. What are their psychosocial working conditions? What are the obstacles to their being healthy? I personally have learned a tremendous amount about uh, during the pandemic year, a tremendous amount about what's happening on our university campus from meeting with the maintenance workers. They've been a huge source of valuable information for me about what the issues are, where the risks are, what needs to be improved in order to reduce transmission risk. Tremendous, tremendously valuable input. And they are not used to being listened to. They, they say, most people don't listen to us with the respect that you're giving us, which is very upsetting to me. And it really tells me that the valuable information they have isn't going into decision-making processes in the way that it ought to. So we, with all of the, what can be going on under the surface, if we don't ask, we won't find out. Um, we need this information about their lived experiences, not just to define the problem, but also to, to design solutions that are going to be meaningful and feasible. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, this is one of our earliest field tests. We used the uh, design team process uh, with a property management company. This was a company that ran some very large apartment buildings. And the real estate, the, the maintenance workers for this real estate company, the, the people who were responsible for maintaining the physical facilities uh, of the apartment buildings, um, were the group of workers who we engaged as a design team. We actually thought they might choose heat stress as their first problem to solve because um, we thought that would be easier and we thought it was really bothering them quite a bit. Um, but they actually tackled a much more complex issue, which worried us a little bit about whether it was going to be feasible. They, they focused on job stress right from the very beginning. And they very quickly identified many forms of poor communication as the root causes of their job stress from overload, from excessive workload. Uh, so they, they highlighted uh, inadequate training of themselves in using the communication system, but also inadequate training of the residents of the apartments, the people who lived in the apartments, for how to submit work orders and also how to fix small things within their apartment that they could do safely and effectively. Um, there was a telephone system that didn't work very well, which led to um, poor communication between the central office and the real and the maintenance workers. Uh, poor quality parts were being provided. Work orders were coming in in duplicate uh, because of the um, poor system for managing intake of uh, requests, um, inadequate call screening. So again, lots of kind of technical communication issues that were leading them to going back to apartments repeatedly or having to kind of move all over the apartment complex in very inefficient ways uh, and not be able to use their time effectively. So they actually um, designed a new communication system with the goal of improving communication among all parties, the, the central office, the people living in the apartments, and themselves. Uh, management had estimated uh, annual cost of about $250,000 a, a year for overtime that was resulting from all of these inefficiencies, by the way. Uh, so that motivated management to 
try out the ideas that the workers put in front of them. So they help develop educational materials, both for the residents of the apartments and also for the office staff and policies for the computerized work order system. Uh, they, uh, they helped to select a uh, new um, pager cell phone type devices that would give them access to the online system for managing work orders wherever they were in the complex and enable them to uh, cancel out work orders that were submitted in duplicate, which they had already handled, and to reassign them to different technicians depending on where people were physically located on the complex. So they, they, it was a very comprehensive uh, program, really quite impressive at what they developed. Um, this is uh, per their perceptions of improvement, um, uh, actually both from the front office and the real estate and the maintenance workers themselves. So in each case, they were asked to say how um, these dimensions had compared to one year previously. And you can see um, very large, uh, almost nothing getting worse and very large improvements in staff morale, in feeling recognized, in having opportunities to have input, um, better communication in, in several different areas. And then uh, we also did interviews with both the design team members and management. And those were very interesting as well, because they felt very, very satisfied with the fact that they had been able to make improvements happen. And they also felt that they were taken seriously in a completely new way, that they were looked at with much more respect and, and seen as people who had good problem solving skills because they had helped to develop this program. And in fact, the managers said, that not only were they more aware of workers' concerns, but they saw the skills of the design team members. They saw how much the maintenance technicians could contribute to the whole enterprise being successful and they wanted the program to continue. Another example comes from a rural community hospital. The employee health nurse uh, heard about our program at a conference uh, like this, uh, a talk, and she recruited members of the ergonomics team and the safety committee to participate in a design team. They actually started with uh, safe patient handling issues. Later, they went on to the problem of assault in this uh, hospital, um, violent episodes from uh, uh, patients and family members. So looking at the um, issue of patient handling injuries, they did have some lift equipment, but when the design team did an evaluation of the program, they uncovered a lot of problems. Uh, so the lift equipment was stored in places where it wasn't easily accessible. There was insufficient staffing to use the equipment because you generally need two people at one time, one person to make sure that the patient is positioned properly on the lift and the other person to actually operate the lift. Uh, they also uncovered that um, staff were highly fatigued from uh, insufficient rest break scheduling and uh, work schedules that were preventing them from getting enough sleep and that that fatigue was uh, perceived by the nurses themselves as a strong predictor of back injuries occurring. This was something that would never have come to light. It had, these work organization issues had not been recognized previously as a problem. Um, manage, this is a quote from the, the nurse manager. They had no understanding prior to doing this evaluation about the lack of rest breaks and uh, the um, problems with uh, shift length and sleep that were occurring. So they did certainly focus on uh, the, the technical aspects of the patient handling equipment. They installed more ceiling lifts. They improved uh, the ancillary systems uh, for the patient handling program. They provided more training, uh, but they also increased staffing to facilitate rest breaks and improve work schedules. And then they improved uh, coworker support and worker skills in problem solving. So the, the resources, when you think about the effort 
uh, reward model, when you think about the, the causes of burnout, it's demands relative to resources available to meet those demands. So they, they were improving the resources here that were available. And we can see a pretty substantial decrease in the rate of patient handling injuries over a several year period of time. Uh, I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with workers' compensation uh, experience modification. This is how we sort of quantify improvements in the US system. So this basically the experience modification went to um, 0.5, went to one half of what it had been previously, which is a very marked improvement. Uh, another example, we've been working for quite a long time with correctional officers in the state of Connecticut. This is a very, very, very stressed population. Uh, they have some of the worst health outcomes of any occupational group. Lots of chronic disease, uh, hypertension, major depression, uh, obesity, um, poor life expectancy, 12 years less than other male public sector workers in the same state. Very high premature mortality. They, they work very, very hard to retire and then they die soon after they retire. It's, it's really quite dreadful. Um, and they, they, uh, their, their work stress, their burnout, their long hours are linked to a, a whole range of adverse health behaviors, which of course worsen their health outcomes. Uh, and uh, they themselves list all of these issues as their own priorities. They have a long list of concerns, not only violence, the threat of violence from inmates, but also the way that violence is internalized and potentially um, expressed among coworkers uh, or even as take home uh, domestic violence sometimes. Um, work family imbalance, meaning the correctional officer is never able to go see a kid's soccer game. They miss a lot of birthday parties and school concerts, all sorts of family events that they are absent from because of the demands of their job. Uh, there's a lot of mental health issues related to um, physical trauma, either directly experienced or seeing other people. Uh, experience violence, uh, having to suppress their emotions in order to keep doing the job, uh, issues with sleep, of course, not at all surprising, depression, suicide, substance use, uh, and then, of course, a lot of cardiovascular disease, which follows right, quite logically from these kinds of stressors. So as I said, we've been working with them for a long time. Uh, the uh, corrections officers, this is in the state of Connecticut, they have used design teams to create and implement a whole variety of health programs that are customized to their situation, addressing physical fitness, nutrition and weight loss, uh, in reducing tension between coworkers, so improving relationships among coworkers, uh, and improving indoor air quality, which in the end actually led to the state purchasing a completely new ventilation system for one of the prisons, which was an extraordinary success. The supervisors of the corrections officers so, saw how well this program was working, and they took it upon themselves to create a design team for themselves to address their own stressors with a lot of attention to sleep issues. And those all of those successes led to a new program within the entire state corrections system uh, to develop a peer mentoring health program for the new recruits. And I wanna tell you especially about this program because again, it fits into this idea of improving uh, co-worker support. You, you know that uh, co-worker and supervisor support can buffer the negative effects of job stress to a meaningful extent. And, and co-worker support is a resource that can help to reduce burnout uh, in jobs where people face a lot of challenges. So this peer mentoring program involved having senior corrections officers volunteer to mentor new corrections officers. So in the same job group, just people with more experience, 
the senior people who are not uh, didn't have any professional health expertise. And very importantly, they were not the direct supervisors of the new recruits who were being mentored. But we did give them some training in health mentoring techniques and in specific topics, uh, such as all the ones I've just been listing for you that are major problems for corrections officers. Uh, we've been following the cohort of mentors and mentees, the, the junior uh, officers who are being mentored. We've been following this cohort uh, over five years with three different assessments. The peer mentored uh, younger uh, corrections officers have had really dramatic uh, improvements in workplace burnout and possibly some improvement in uh, body fat and fitness as well. Uh, so, and, and they themselves very, very strongly uh, endorse this program uh, in terms of the, um, the way in which, so agency here means uh, being the one who takes action rather than being acted on. So the, this is, this whole program has supported corrections officers to see themselves as being able to um, improve their own health and work situations. And they've pointed to a huge range of benefits, um, better uh, balance between work and life uh, issues, uh, greater awareness of their health and the risk factors for well-being, uh, improved intention to stay on the job and, and actually lower turnover, um, uh, having uh, better uh, co-worker uh, relationships and morale, you, you can see the list for yourself. So this is an idea that could be adapted for other settings, for nurses, for a corporate office staff, and so on. Um, we have prepared a mentoring toolkit specifically directed to the corrections workforce that will be available on our website very soon. And it lays out the details of how to get the program started, forming a steering committee, training, uh, recruiting and training the mentors, matching them with uh, junior employees to be mentored and how to evaluate the program. And again, we, we see this as something that has potential relevance to other settings, but is certainly badly needed in this sector. Uh, another way to address uh, co-worker support is an example uh, of, uh, from, of a program at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. It's not actually part of CPH New, but we've been evaluating it this year. Um, this, address, this is a program that addresses uh, discriminatory behaviors, which are another source of stress. They're not represented in any of our standard models like the demand control uh, or effort reward and balance model, um, but they're getting a lot more attention finally as uh, sources of stress, um, it, behaviors that might seem subtle to someone who isn't experiencing, experiencing them directly, um, but which tend to reinforce stereotypes and undermine self-confidence and definitely lead to negative uh, coworker and potentially supervisor relationships as well. Um, this is a faculty initiated program that, that then received uh, federal government support, motivated by concern about recruiting and retaining women faculty in what we call the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So how to improve the work climate so that we would be able to bring more women faculty in and be able to keep them at the university. We're now, in addition to gender issues, we're now also attending equally to race and ethnicity in the forms that microaggressions can take. So the university faculty developed the training content and the role-playing scenarios. Um, there are peer run sessions, so faculty training other faculty members with hands on practice. And the goal is to build people's confidence and skill in how to identify microaggressions in the moment that they're happening and how to interrupt them gracefully without creating worse, uh, without, without uh, creating negative uh, relationships with people. And all of these links, by the way, are going to be provided to you after the lecture. We have them 
posted on the, the resource page. Uh, one other example in terms of improving relationships at work uh, is a program uh, developed by some colleagues of ours uh, at uh, the Oregon Health Sciences University uh, specifically to train supervisors to help improve the health of their employees. And the target group, uh, of course, you could have benefits for all employees, but the target group was employees who have prior military service. Uh, after the many wars, especially in Afghanistan and Iraq, where many, many people have been mobilized and then returned to civilian jobs, we have a lot of veterans of the US military in ordinary civilian work. Uh, and that can be, of course, an extremely challenging transition. I know in Colombia, there's a, a similar phenomenon, um, somewhat perhaps even more, more strenuous, more stressful. Uh, so, so this may be of particular interest to you, I don't know. Uh, and the program was one in which supervisors were trained to support to, to uh, learn how to listen to employees about their past military service, as well as potentially their ongoing military reserve duty, uh, to listen to their challenges in juggling work and military service in terms of job safety, family needs, uh, sleep issues, and so on. The supervisors were not only trained, but then the researchers tracked the behavior of the supervisors to evaluate whether or not they put into effect the things that they had learned how to do in their training. So they were being monitored to see if they practiced the behaviors that they had been taught. And the there are numerous results of this uh, project. This website, which also you have available to you on the resource page, um, gives a, a lot of fact sheets um, with uh, the sources of evidence for these different conclusions. Um, so they found that the, the veterans, the employees, benefited from better supervisor support in many ways, higher job satisfaction, better job performance, intention to stay on the job, better physical health, better mental health, especially those with post-traumatic stress disorder uh, experienced um, notable improvements in mental health and um, better marital and family relationships as well. So really, really quite positive outcomes from this project. Okay, so I want to, of course, be, um, mindful that the whole idea of bringing workers in to participate in a, a, a health improvement program may seem very challenging to you. And there are genuine challenges. Um, there, there may be issues about um, willingness of top management to allocate resources uh, or to guarantee confidentiality and privacy for people who are participating. Uh, in the United States, and I think in many other countries in the Americas, a fairly low proportion of the workforce is unionized, which you may think that's good or bad, but the reality is that that means that as a society, we don't have a lot of experience with the democratic representation of workers' opinions in the workplace is very, very different, for example, in Northern Europe. We have very few structures. We're not used to seeing this. It's not normalized for, the, for us in the way that it could be. So managers are often very reluctant to include workers in decision-making. They don't trust that people will join in in a constructive way. They may not be aware of the uh, intelligence and, and experience and knowledge and skills that can be brought to that process. And workers may be reluctant because they're worried about reprisal, right? They're worried about loss of job security or loss of promotion opportunities if they say anything negative, if they call attention to any problems. Um, so, so they're, and, and people may not listen to each other with equal respect, regardless of the positions that they hold within the organization. 
So this is, I think, the kind of question that was reflected in some of the concerns that came back to me three weeks ago. Um, how do we how do we get management through those kinds of um, that form of resistance, basically? Um, because really, to be honest, a, a, a workforce health program isn't going to be successful if it doesn't elicit workers' knowledge about their jobs and their work environment and respect that as important information that everyone can benefit from having and using. Uh, a successful program is going to gain credibility with the workforce because their own health and safety priorities are incorporated into the decision-making process. Uh, it's successful when it recognizes that the process of giving people decision-making opportunities is just as important as what the problem is that the program is trying to solve. Um, and putting all of this together, um, we really like the phrase salutogenic organization. This comes from our colleague Georg Bauer in Zurich, Switzerland who talks about an organization that can be health creating salutogenic in by following these kinds of principles. So the NIOSH Total Worker Health Program has a set of what they call defining elements or fundamentals, which are the, the thing, what do you start with? How do you begin to implement a program like this? And I've pulled out a few of them to highlight. So leadership commitment is of course necessary. If you don't have leadership buy-in, you're not gonna be able to do any of what we've been talking about here. So top leaders have to be willing to communicate that worker health and safety is a core value to them and they have to provide the resources to make that a reality in the workplace. Managers and supervisors in some way need to understand what their impact is on workforce well-being and need to be held accountable for that in some way. Um, they need to ensure that production demands don't compromise well-being. They need to value good communication in both directions. They need to understand the importance of flexibility and opportunities for staff growth. So these are, these are important starting points. Uh, workers, as I've been saying, workers need to be involved in identifying the issues that are most important to them, anticipating potential barriers, what can go wrong, what will stop people from using or complying with uh, the programs that are put into place. And the long-term sustainability of any new initiative is really going to depend on these. Uh, we need to therefore create opportunities for employees to get engaged. And these can be really simple things like suggestion boxes or um, an idea board is when you put a question on a big open bulletin board or whiteboard and see what responses workers have. Um, but you have to communicate how that input was used or people will see it as not genuine and they'll, they'll stop making the effort, they'll stop uh, putting out any uh, information uh, or, or any effort. Um, getting employee feedback on changes before they're implemented is very, very important. Um, adding frontline employees to committees, especially the ones that are actually designing solutions that are trying to solve problems. Design teams are what I've been telling you about. Kaizen groups are another example. These are teams that come together over shorter time periods uh, to solve problems. Uh, and, and also to recognize employees who get involved. When someone takes the time and makes the effort and takes the risk to speak up, um, it's really important to listen and recognize them. Um, worker engagement isn't just a checkbox. Worker input has to be used and valued. Uh, find out what workers see as obstacles. I really can't emphasize this enough. Um, what, are the, what are the ways that the workplace uh, might potentially be providing barriers to health and well-being, and also uh, what, what ways might the workplace be supporting people being healthy. Uh, for example, we have many examples of this with the correctional workers. So when we surveyed them about their eating habits, 
um, we found that staff scheduling, work scheduling was really getting in the way of healthy eating because often corrections officers were being held over for a second shift or sometimes even a third consecutive shift uh, due to staffing shortages. And when this happened, um, some of them didn't have enough food from home to make it through their unplanned second shift. So they would call, they would order takeout, which is very often unhealthy. Other people would bring in a giant lunch box with enough food for three shifts, and then they would eating, they would end up eating all of the food that they had brought in, even if they weren't staying at work that long. So they, they got together and they identified uh, places where healthier takeout food could be obtained. They got more nutritious foods added to the vending machines in their workplaces. Um, but this problem wouldn't even have come to light without worker focus groups uh, and a willingness to act on the information that was learned. Uh, I think on uh, June 26, we talked about the really, really important aspects of worker confidentiality and privacy in relation to workers accessing employee assistance programs. NIOSH, again, emphasizes very strongly that without worker confidentiality and privacy, you're not going to be able to have a, an ethical or an effective program. So all these uh, kinds of data that might be collected in the workplace, they have to be protected very strictly as confidential. Uh, and it may be necessary in some cases to de-identify data, to actually destroy personal identifiers or to have data collected from outside the organization so that management can't see who said what. And also we're, we're very careful as researchers to report back only group level data so that no one can be identified individually as having um, said or contributed a particular piece of information. Um, with, without these kinds of adequate protections, workers won't participate. They won't risk their, their job security um, for, for a, a program that's going to um, not respect their contributions in this way. Uh, what else you can do? You can actually just, you can start by looking at the organization very broadly, finding out what kinds of things other program managers are doing, what are their priorities? If you're in health and safety, what's happening in human resources? Are they thinking about job stress? Are, are the workers' compensation staff trying to do anything to prevent injury? Is there a health promotion focus somewhere within the human resources office? How can all of these different functions coordinate uh, and, and plan together and think about how their different programs might interact either positively or negatively. Uh, so in wrapping up again, our uh, Healthy Workplace Participatory Program Toolkit is available uh, freely on our website. Uh, we, uh, it explains each step for engaging workers in doing root cause analysis and uh, carrying that through to intervention. It provides numerous training tools for those of you who might want to think about getting started. For example, there are a wide range of professionally produced training videos uh, available. Uh, there's an online survey of uh, organizational readiness. I'll come back to that in a second. A whole range of worksheets and uh, facilitator guides. So a variety of um, group activity documents to guide the design team members and facilitators through the process. Um, just one example of, of what you'll find if you look here. So this is for step two in the wheel, developing objectives and activities. Uh, so this is uh, what it says on that web page. There's a multi-level framework guide as a checklist, a job stress intervention guide you may be particularly interested in. I've actually provided that PDF file uh, as part of the uh, materials that are available after this talk. So, so worksheets like this are provided and, and intervention guides are provided um, for each step in this process. 
The organizational readiness survey, the idea here is to assess the resources that are in place. Does your organization have the knowledge and the competencies that are needed to implement a successful program? And it, it's diagnostic, essentially. What are the things that you need to do first to strengthen the organization in terms of training or communications plan or bringing people around to, to the table um, to, to plan jointly? Uh, what areas that would be obstacles if you tried to implement a participatory program right now and how you can develop strengths there so that the organization can move forward. So this survey is also available on our website and it covers a number of different domains all developed from the literature. So what is the current status of your programs within the organization? What resources do you have available? What uh, willingness is there, especially in top management, to try new things? Uh, how easy is it to bring people together for discussions? How, how easy would it be to engage people in a team? Uh, how well do people work with each other? Uh, are there methods already in place for employee input? And uh, does management communicate with the workforce about health and safety and well being? So, the, the survey um, guides you in thinking about how to uh, initiate a participatory program, how to identify areas that need to be strengthened, and what to do about that. And our end, so we are, we do have this survey available right now. Um, our end goal eventually is to provide a, a validated uh, tool for diagnosing at the organizational level that will give anyone who answers a survey uh, a dashboard or a scorecard about their organization. So we want a larger sample size so that we can do all of the fancy statistical analyses that we have in mind. So we're still collecting data. The survey is available at this link. Again, this will be available to you later. This, this link takes you directly to our survey, which would give you the opportunity to take it yourself anonymously. Uh, but at the moment, it's only available in English. And actually, Sora is interested in knowing whether you would be uh, willing to consider answering it in English or whether you would like to have it available in Spanish, as you can see. So your answer to this question will be very helpful uh, in thinking about whether there's enough interest to justify the effort uh, that it would take and the, the cost of translating it into Spanish. Looks like about a third of the people have answered. Um, I think the poll can stay up while I go to my last slide, I think. Yes, sure, Laura, uh, yes, it's going to perfect. still like. So, Yes, so, so while, the, while people are still finishing up the poll, I just want to say um, again, this is uh, the, the work that I've been sharing has obviously been uh, carried out by many, many people, uh, a really large and dedicated group of people working together over about 15 years. Um, we'd be really happy to hear from you. This is our main website. You can sign up for our e-newsletter on this website using the Contact Us button if you'd like to be receiving our regular newsletter uh, and find out about new uh, materials and programs as they come available. This is the link to the toolkit. And uh, I'm, if anybody wants to read the scientific articles that this material is based on, um, if you have an interest in reading more about what's on a particular slide, I can provide those sources as well. So thank you very, very much for your attention today. Thanks to you, Laura. It was really a pleasure to hear you. So now we are going to the session of uh, question and answer, Viviola. Okay. Sí, señora. Bueno, Laura.
Muy interesante, muy interesante. Hay algunas preguntas, algunas mías incluidas, porque me pareció súper interesante, pero me generó un par de inquietudes. Um, voy a empezar con una de esas inquietudes que yo tengo, por lo que conozco de la ley en Colombia. Cuando tú empezaste a presentar la forma como se organizan los equipos, eh, lo que mostrabas es que pareciera que los equipos se organizan en función de identificar un problema de salud y alrededor del problema de salud se empiezan a pensar posibles causas y luego posibles soluciones, si yo entendí bien, ¿cierto? Eh, lo que yo sé es que en Colombia usualmente las, las organizaciones miden causas sin tener todavía identificado un problema. Es decir, problemas de salud no se suelen medir en Colombia de manera regular. De manera que yo me preguntaba si es posible hacer lo mismo, es decir, hacer grupos de trabajo en torno a cosas que los cuestionarios que en Colombia usualmente se miden identifican como posibles factores de riesgo en el trabajo y empezar a pensar a partir de allí cómo evaluar posibles condiciones de salud que se puedan estar afectando, cómo solucionarlas o siempre es mejor partir de un problema de salud que se ha identificado porque si eso es así, es importantísimo que las organizaciones en Colombia hicieran más medición de condiciones de salud que usualmente no se miden. No hay registros regulares usualmente de los problemas de salud que la gente está teniendo. Entonces, pues pareciera como que no hay problema porque no hay problemas de salud y es que no los piden. No sé si, me, si fui clara en mi pregunta. Uh, I'll try to answer it and if I don't get it right, then then redirect me, please. Um, the, uh, the, the, the team doesn't need to start with a, an end stage health problem like depression or suicide or heart attack. Um, people generally have a pretty good sense of what, their, what, the, what the immediate stressors are in their job. And it may be that, uh, for example, if people have a tremendous amount of time pressure at work uh, or, or a lot of um, uh, overload or, or difficult shift schedules, they aren't all going to have the same health effect necessarily. Some people may be sleeping badly. Other people may be eating too much. Other people may be yelling at their family members. We're not trying to align those health effects. We're trying to go upstream and ask what's the cause So if everybody feels in one way or another that the work overload is causing problems, it, it doesn't matter if those problems are different for different people. Okay. We've, we've got the immediate experience of something that is destabilizing the, the um, equilibrium within the person, even if it manifests okay. itself in different ways. So the okay. survey could be about the working conditions directly, could be about... Okay physical workload and mental workload and time pressure and coworker support and supervisor support, all the things that have been covered during this webinar series. Mm -hmm. Or it could be about um, short-term um, symptoms or, or sort of immediate manifestations like mm -hmm. uh, sleep quality, not mm -hmm. getting enough sleep, um, having back pain okay. all the time, having a lot of headaches. You know, you, could, you can ask about those sort of short-term symptoms. We're not trying to do a scientific study here that proves cause and effect. We've got an enormous amount of literature. Hopefully mm -hmm. that's evident already to people who've been participating in this series. Okay. So we, we don't have to be super rigorous about what mm -hmm. the endpoints are that we choose. Okay, gracias, Laura. Um, hay otra pregunta. Tú al final decías que tú considerabas que en ciertas partes del proceso debería haber involucradas personas externas a la organización. ¿Tú podrías ampliarnos un poco como en qué partes debería haber personas externas o equipos internos, eh, perdón, externos, eh, o si es mejor que sea en todo el proceso? Eh, porque claramente hay riesgos eh, en, en que no haya personas externas. Y yo también me preguntaba si esos equipos empiezan a plantear soluciones del, del tipo tradicional. Hagamos cursos de manejo de estrés, hagamos cursos de relajación, o sea que el hecho de que haya equipos no necesariamente garantiza que van a proponer trabajar sobre las 
causas, sino que podrían quedarse solamente en las, en las consecuencias. Y si no hay alguien externo conocedor que haga caer en cuenta de esto, podrían quedarse en, en lo mismo de siempre. Yes, um, this is a really important issue. I'm glad you asked about it. So I was um, I was wanting to be honest to say that in where I have a lot of information about workplaces that we've been collecting, where we've been doing research, we have helped to provide extra support for this facilitation process. Mm -hmm. um, but our goal always is to train internal facilitators. Mm -hmm. So we work with the people who are in the program to try to identify someone in-house who's a good listener, who can be uh, you know, as impartial as possible, um, mm -hmm. who, who is sharing the goals of uh, improving the work process for everyone. And we teach them how to utilize the the all the facilitator manuals and worksheets and and things that we provide and we actually also um uh do some teaching around basic um facilitator skills help mm -hmm. help people be good facilitators mm -hmm. um bringing in someone from the outside can be useful um I, I, if when we do it, we're coming in as researchers. So I guess we have the vested interest in the program succeeding, but we don't have any other vested interest other than how to help this program succeed. We're not trying to sell something. Uh, and we're, because our research program is funded, we're not charging the company. Um, we, we actually might start doing a little bit of fee-for-service facilitating because of the there is some demand that we aren't able to meet through our research programs. But in general, we're really trying to create the, we're, tr we're trying to make the toolkit as comprehensive as possible so that an external facilitator is not needed because mm -hmm. we recognize, especially mm -hmm. for, for smaller mm -hmm. organizations, that mm -hmm. that's not going to be a, a feasible cost. Mm -hmm. Okay. Al menos, al menos debe haber alguien como ustedes que ayude a entrenar a las personas que van a hacer el proceso. Y eso es una, una parte en la que alguien externo puede participar y colaborar. Ok, voy a, a cambiar porque hay un par de preguntas muy importantes, Laura, que, que han venido siendo también presentadas en otras sesiones, porque hay varias personas que dicen, eh, digamos, una dificultad con todo esto es que los empleadores no siempre tienen la conciencia de lo importante que es esto, entonces no, no dan tiempo para, para, para que se hagan ese tipo de eventos, eh, no, dan, no, no dan el apoyo, no dan los recursos, eh, no se involucran en, en el, el asunto, un poco el tema de salud mental es un tema que no, no parece ser tan relevante, o sea, un poco la inquietud general es como qué recursos hay para ayudar a convencer a las directivas, a la, al management, de que se involucre, de que apoye este tipo de, de actividades, cómo mostrar la relevancia, la importancia de ellos, que suele ser algo que no pasa. Y mucha gente se siente como sin herramientas de cómo poder hacer eso. Yes, I, I, in my talk on June 26, uh, I, I, uh, compiled a lot of information about the costs to the organization of not fixing these problems for exactly that reason. So, so if we could solve this difficulty just by having um, factual information to put in front of managers, then you're welcome to the slides that I presented three weeks ago, and you can use those and, and put that information in front of your manager, and maybe that will make the case successfully. I share the frustration that uh, for some reason, even seeing how much it can cost an organization, it, that somehow still isn't always enough to change current practice. And I don't know exactly how we get there. I think we need to be teaching this kind of thing in, in business school programs. I think that everyone who's earning a master's in business administration should learn about the impact of working conditions on population health and should see that they 
potentially bear some responsibility in their future career for how they how they address these issues. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, we're living in a day and age where, where in lots of in lots of domains, factual information doesn't carry the weight that it used to, and I, I'm really quite um, horrified by seeing that in in other contexts. But this is a long-standing problem in regard to employee mm -hmm. health. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I've you know for for decades there have been people writing about why isn't it enough to show managers how expensive these problems are when you don't mm -hmm. fix them. Mm -hmm. So for everybody who's feeling frustrated about that, I share that frustration. I wish there was a really easy answer. I think you just have to keep presenting the data over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you know, the, the scientific literature should be influential. You probably need local data too. You probably want to try to think about how to organize information about your own workplace. How big is the turnover problem? Mm -hmm. You know, a, a one question survey that asks people if they're thinking about leaving the job in the next two years, if you get a lot of answers to that, that should raise a really big concern mm -hmm. because turnover is linked to job insatisfaction. Mm -hmm. It's so, so strongly. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, maybe there, there are small bits of data collection that can be influential, mm -hmm. you know, even without a lot of um, complicated research. Pero un, un asunto que quiero destacar de lo que tú dices es que tal vez a los, a los eh, managers no se les convence, digamos, llegando al corazón, mostrando qué tan afectadas están las personas, como pobres personas tienen problemas de salud, sino mostrarles lo que a ellos les cuesta, porque en últimas los business o las empresas quieren hacer ese es negocio, ¿cierto? El, el objetivo del negocio no es ocuparse solamente de la salud de la gente, la salud de la gente es importante porque eso hace que su negocio sea mejor. Entonces, datos como los que tú nos ofreciste en términos del costo de, de los problemas de salud de la gente, pues los pueden convencer de que invertir en este tipo de cosas puede ser a la larga más barato, puede ser más efectivo que seguir negando y decir eh, no hay tiempo, no hay dinero para este tipo de cosas. Ok. Eh, Violam. Señor. Si, 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 si me permites eh, compartirles algo que de pronto puede ser de utilidad, algo que particularmente yo he visto que ha sido muy efectivo con los directivos es cuando se vuelve parte de sus indicadores de gestión eh, datos de salud y datos del control de los riesgos. Entonces, eh, usualmente y sobre todo cuando se habla de alta gerencia, eh, hay una orientación muy eh, dirigida al logro de unos objetivos que usualmente las juntas de las organizaciones se plantean. Cuando esas juntas toman la decisión de decirle, yo a usted no lo voy a medir solamente por los resultados que produzca, sino por el efecto que obtener esos resultados genere para el trabajador y será su responsabilidad garantizar no solamente tener buenos objetivos de negocio, sino que haya bajos niveles de ausentismo, haya bajos niveles de rotación y haya muy buenas condiciones de salud, el directivo entiende esa, esa lógica porque es la lógica por la cual están entrenados el mundo de los negocios. Entonces, a mí uh -huh. particularmente eh, es difícil que tomen esa decisión. Yo he presentado esa recomendación varias veces. Es difícil sobre todo porque quien toma la decisión es el mismo directivo, ¿no? Entonces, muchas veces tiene que ser una junta la que tome la, la decisión o el presidente o el gerente de una empresa que se comprometa con el asunto y pero cuando la toman de ahí para abajo si hay unos indicadores claros que incluyen salud suele eh, orientarse toda la gestión también alrededor de esto perfecto uh, gracias Sebastián aquí hay una pregunta que me parece que tiene hace un, un punto importante que yo creo que es algo que muchos de los empleadores tienen miedo de por qué darle voz a los empleadores. Aquí el, el, la, voy a leer tal cual la pregunta. Dice, todos los esfuerzos que realizan las empresas por disminuir y controlar el factor de riesgo psicosocial se deben ver reflejados en la respuesta de la población trabajadora de manera que se obtenga algo mutuamente beneficioso. No se trata de dar gusto en todo, pero sí evaluar y tener un equilibrio. ¿A qué me refiero? Yo creo que muchos empleadores temen preguntarle a sus empleados porque creen que los empleados van a pedir de todo y después no saben cómo decir no a algunas cosas, ¿cierto? Es un poco el miedo de que me van a pedir más dinero, me van a pedir cosas que yo no puedo, que yo no puedo negociar. Y, y me parece que eso está a la base de mucha de la prevención que tienen muchos empleadores 
de hacer cosas como las que tú has descrito, Laura. Yo no sé si cuál es tu experiencia y qué dirías al respecto, pero creo que es un problema central de, de, de lo que genera miedo en los empleadores. Yeah, it, it probably is. I have been really interested to see in the design teams that we have supported that the workers actually um, limit them. Their impulse is to limit what they ask for because anything that is going to cost money, they're afraid there'll be a negative answer. So it's they it's almost the opposite of what you're saying is what actually happens, that, mm -hmm. that workers are very cognizant of uh, limited resources and very concerned to make reasonable, to make requests that are perceived as reasonable by top management. I think actually top management would probably be surprised if they allowed workers to, to do something like this because they would actually see that a lot of, there's a lot of creativity and ingenuity in thinking about low, low, relatively low cost, solution. Improving communication is not, you don't have to spend millions of dollars on it. You know, you, you maybe have to allocate a little bit of person time to making sure that certain, you know, important information is transmitted in both directions, but it's not a dreadfully expensive thing to do. Allowing workers to make suggestions about how to coordinate their schedule so that people get time off when they need to take care of their kids That's not a terribly expensive thing either, but the mm. benefits in terms of mental health and job satisfaction are phenomenal. Mm. So I think employers probably tend to, you know, really over uh, estimate what people are going to ask for. I want to I want to emphasize because I didn't talk about this very much when we teach the design team to make a business case presentation. They always put forward three proposals, because if you just come with one thing, this is, I think, what Sebastian was talking about. If you say, either, here's the one thing we want, they can say no. There's always a way to say no, because there's always something mm -hmm. wrong with whatever you're asking for, right? But if you have three different ideas and you can, you can rank them, you can say, look, this one is going to take longer and it's going to be more expensive, but the probable payoff over you know, two years or five years or whatever is going to be much, much greater. This one you could put into effect right away. It would be a lot less expensive, but it wouldn't have the same expected benefits over the long term. So, mm -hmm. so for the workers to learn to use that kind of language really gets the attention of management. Management doesn't expect workers to be able to talk like that. And workers themselves come to understand that asking for the cheapest thing isn't necessarily the best, but, but it engages everybody in this conversation about how costs and benefits, basically. And, and so that takes away the, some of the fear on both sides. Because people are, you know, we're, we, we really work at teaching the workers to use the same language that management is accustomed to so that this conversation can happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sí, eh, precisamente con alguna persona que estaba mandando preguntas, terminamos conversando casi que bien privado, eh, porque, porque ella me decía cómo darle participación a personas de bajo nivel, ¿cierto? Y yo le decía, aún las personas del más bajo nivel tienen ideas sobre cómo mejorar ciertas condiciones de trabajo. Además que si las personas llegan a pedir cosas que se salen, digamos, de las posibilidades de la empresa, en la medida en que son escuchados y pueden escuchar por qué no se pueden hacer, por qué hay que hacer, ponerle límites a ciertas cosas, las personas quedan más satisfechas, pero se sienten escuchados, que es distinto a lo que solemos hacer, que es no escuchar. Nosotros decidimos qué es lo que hay que hacer y buscamos como listas de soluciones, qué hacer para esto y esto es lo que se hace y eso es lo que se ordena desde la dirección o desde, desde arriba que se debe hacer sin escuchar a los trabajadores. Y tú lo decías desde el principio, si la gente no conoce, si la gente no está comprometida, ya la intervención empieza con el pie izquierdo, como decimos en español, empieza mal, empieza con un pronóstico de que probablemente no vaya a funcionar. Hay muchas preguntas, Laura, aquí como de, 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 de intervenciones específicas para mejorar eh, la comunicación, para, me, para mejorar si hay estrés postraumático. Yo no sé, yo por eso creo que probablemente tú no puedas ofrecer soluciones específicas para todos los muchos problemas. Y, y como decíamos al principio, probablemente 
eh, en cada caso, incluso para el mismo problema, puede haber soluciones distintas. Por eso no hay una lista como de, de, de recomendaciones. Lo que hay que hacer es esto. Hay una, dos, tres, cuatro opciones y mucho depende de las condiciones particulares de cada organización. Supongo que tú opinarías algo parecido. <laughs> yeah, we do bring information from research studies to the design teams. If, you know, we say here, look, you know, this was, somebody tried this in another country and this worked for the following reasons or it didn't work for the following reasons. So that information can be relevant and useful. But yes, if it's, if it's not going to succeed in the local conditions for a particular reason, you need to uncover that and, and not waste your time trying to do something just because it worked in another setting altogether. Mm -hmm. um, hay una pregunta que yo quisiera que tratáramos de cerrar con esto, Sebastián. Hubo personas que preguntaron dónde conseguir eh, más información sobre algunas de las intervenciones particulares que tú señalaste. Ya tú mostraste tu página, ¿cierto? Pero sería interesante que pudiéramos decirle, Sebastián, cómo pueden acceder a los diferentes enlaces a los que, de los que eh, Laura nos ha hablado a través de, la, de su sesión para que todas las personas que quieran ya sea buscar artículos publicados o encontrar algunas de las instrucciones que tú mostrabas que tienen en las páginas, que son instrucciones de cómo entrenar en diferentes cosas. Claro, están en inglés, pero muchas personas podrían, si están interesados, tratar de traducir algunos de estos de estas herramientas eh, para poder hacer uso de ellas. Entonces sería bueno si pudiéramos explicarle a las personas nuevamente cómo acceder a todos estos materiales eh, que Laura nos, nos ha mostrado. Sí, Laura muy amablemente, de hecho en parte de su preparación, elaboró un documento con todos los enlaces y de dónde podemos acceder a ellos. Vamos a ponerlos en la página web de las memorias, donde pueden consultar el la conferencia grabada en inglés y en español, ahí mismo vamos a poner esos enlaces y yo particularmente, Laura, eh, pues te quiero decir que estoy muy sorprendido, gratamente sorprendido, muy contento de ver todo lo que han logrado hacer en el proceso de intervención. Eh, mi trabajo profesional ha estado focalizado sobre todo en la parte de evaluación y diagnóstico, entonces es muy satisfactorio ver cómo se puede trascender los datos a un proceso ya de intervención particular y de hecho sé que está en inglés en la medida de lo posible, pues Prax intentará también, eh, con tu permiso, eh, poder generar unas versiones en español, porque creo que tienen una experiencia muy valiosa y tienen una serie de recursos ahí muy importantes para, para, todo, para todo público. Entonces creo que es, es, es vital poder intentar disponer esos recursos en muchos más idiomas. Entonces Ajá. cuenten con eso, en la página de memoria van a estar disponibles hoy al final del día y a todos los inscritos se les enviará eh, la información. De igual forma, como este video queda grabado en YouTube, quien lo esté viendo desde YouTube, en la descripción del video pondremos también todos esos enlaces. Eh, ya, ya para cerrar, me gustaría eh, recordarles a los que todavía están aquí presentes que la próxima y última sesión va a estar centrada en cómo entrenar supervisores para hacer cambio organizacional. Entonces, es importante, o sea, es, es como una profundización en uno de los temas que Laura mencionó hoy, entonces creo que aquellos que estén interesados no se lo pueden perder y ojalá lleguen a tiempo para que puedan estar conectados desde el principio con David Hurtado, que trabaja justamente en eh, Oregon en el desarrollo de este tipo de intervenciones. Laura, tú probablemente conoces a, a David, que trabaja en, en, en la Universidad de Oregon y nos va a acompañar la próxima semana. Esa conferencia será en español, así que acá los esperamos a todos. Y Laura, muchas gracias de nuevo. Eh, de verdad, excelente tu presentación. Sabemos todo el esfuerzo que in invertiste en hacer esto. Creo que ha sido muy, muy importante y de verdad te lo quiero agradecer de manera muy especial. Thank you very much. Thank gracias a ti, Laura. To be here. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you again for the honor of participating. No, Laura, Bien. gracias por habernos hecho el honor de acompañarnos. <laughs> Laura Viviola, muchísimas gracias a todos los asistentes y recuerden, no se lo pierdan, la próxima semana nos vemos en la última conferencia de este ciclo de formación. Un muy feliz día para todos.